hair, ray, red. Some verses I was going to uh, read myself. Um, that passage from Colossians chapter 1. But let me just read an alternative um, short passage, which is from Acts chapter 26. And uh, it's part of the Apostle Paul's testimony uh, before King Agrippa. And he describes his conversion there on the uh, Damascus Road. And in verse 14 of Acts 26, he says, And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But arise and stand on your feet, for this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, delivering you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes, so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Let's just pray for God to speak to us through his word now. Father in heaven, you have given us your Holy Spirit as our teacher. Grant that as we come to your word now, that it would be as bread to the hungry, as light to our path in a dark world, and as a swift sword in our hand. To the glory of Jesus we pray. Amen. The gospel of Jesus is the gospel of the kingdom, which is a truth which Ray reminded us of a few weeks ago. And I wanted just to unpack a little bit about that this evening. Uh, probably nothing that you are unaware of, but sometimes these truths go into the uh, recede in, in to the back of our minds and we need them refreshed uh, so that uh, we can live as we ought to do with uh, those truths central in our minds. We live in a world where there are two kingdoms and those two kingdoms are in conflict with each other and tonight being Halloween gives you the clue as to where the conflict lies. Because over against the kingdom of God is the kingdom of Satan. And every person on this planet is in one or other of those two kingdoms, whether they know it or not. And the problems and the tragedies and the crises in our world, which we're bombarded with every day on the news, are due solely to the fact that there are these two kingdoms competing in the world. And the majority of people are in the wrong kingdom, whether they know it or not. And the ruler of the other kingdom goes by a number of titles which reveal the nature of this kingdom. He's referred to in scripture as the prince of this world. In fact, Jesus called him the God of this world. God with a small g. And the adjectives used to describe him include subtle, wicked, unclean, evil, lying, 
and above all, proud, arrogant. That is a horrible description of a character. And Satan is also likened in Scripture to three animals. Two of them come from the reptile family, a wily serpent and a red dragon. The third is a prowling lion. And the Bible uses these pictures of the devil essentially to tell you to be on your guard. On one occasion he's described as the prince of the power of the air. And he has a kingdom. And there are five words used in the Bible to describe that kingdom. It is, first of all, a kingdom of disobedience. Everyone who is disobedient belongs to that kingdom. You were born into it. You grew up disobedient. You learnt what it was to say no before you learnt what it was to say yes. You never had to be taught to be bad, did you? You only had to be taught to be good. You never had to be taught to be rude, only to be polite. You never had to be taught to be dishonest, only to be honest. You were born into a kingdom of disobedience. But then secondly, it is also a kingdom of darkness. Moral darkness, as well as physical darkness. Uh, the darkness there is in this world is a manifestation of the deeds of Satan. Whereas the kingdom of God is a kingdom of light. And then thirdly, we're told that the kingdom of the devil is a kingdom of disease. Why are there hospitals? Why do we need the NHS? Why do pharmaceutical companies make such huge profits at the expense of sick people? It's because we are living in the devil's kingdom. God never intended disease and illness. It's not in his will. In Luke chapter 13, when people brought a woman to Jesus to be healed, he looked at her and he said, Do you see this woman? She has been bound by Satan for 18 years. So it's a kingdom of disease. But fourthly, the devil presides over a kingdom of deception. The Bible points out that many false prophets and deceivers will emerge, not only outside the church, but inside the church as well. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus speaks there of false prophets who will come to you dressed up, disguised, as wolves but in, sheep, in sheep's clothing, disguised as sheep. They are not what they appear to be. Here's what I mean. Uh, I'm imagining, I'm guessing, that some of you um, have already had little people call round as visitors to your home this evening very likely in disguise. And I would say that if, if you tried to guess the identity of the person behind the mask, if you know your neighbours well, you might get some of them right, perhaps. But I'm sure you'd not be 100% correct in guessing the identity of them all. And it illustrates that the kingdom of darkness is characterized by deception. The demonic strategy is to confuse and to distort your thinking, to delude you. The Bible speaks 
of how the devil blinds the minds of unbelievers. Why is it that many of your unconverted family and friends won't listen to you? You talk to them, you share with them their need of Christ, you tell them this, and they are as blind and as deaf as a corpse. What's happened? The answer is, they've been blinded, deceived in their minds. But having said that, it's also got to be said that there are Christians who can be vulnerable to deception as well. There is a mask of deception designed to mislead or simply to lull us into a false sense of security. And one of the real weaknesses in many Christians today, it seems to me, is the inability to discern light from darkness. There's plenty of evil that is patently obvious and transparent in our world. But equally the devil is the master of disguise in his attempt to mislead Christians and to blind them to what is actually happening behind the scenes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 it uh, describes, the Apostle Paul describes him there, the devil, as masquerading as an angel of light. That is why the Bible needs to be circulated and read and studied by God's people. It's the one thing that we've been given by God to know the truth from the lie. And we need to develop such a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit through the Word that we can recognize the satanic when we see it, even when it's disguised. So we have a kingdom of disobedience, a kingdom of darkness, a kingdom of disease, a kingdom of deception. And finally, the devil oversees a kingdom of death. Every time you see a hearse go along the road, you're seeing something that Satan ultimately orchestrated. Death was never intended for human beings. God never intended the profession of undertakers, and they'll be out of a job in heaven. But those five things are indicative of what the devil's purposes are. And it's summarized in John chapter 10 and verse 10. Jesus says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Is it any wonder that Satan is behind the abortion industry? Wherever his kingdom is threatened by babies being born, he aims to kill them. He sought to kill all the babies in Egypt when Moses was about to deliver God's people. At the time of Jesus' birth, he killed all the babies in Bethlehem. And abortion is now spreading like a bushfire throughout the Western world. Satan is a destroyer. Ultimately, the aim is to destroy be it physically, mentally, morally, or spiritually. Whereas Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. But is it any wonder, therefore, that the Lord's Prayer includes the petition, deliver us from evil, and the Greek literally reads, deliver us from the evil one. And it's a reference to the devil. And Jesus, therefore, 
affirms the existence of evil generally and the devil in particular. And it's a reminder that every Christian is in a war. In Hebrews chapter 2 we learn that Jesus came as a human to this earth so that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death and deliver all those who through their fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Other versions put lifelong bondage. So Jesus came into this world and took human flesh to destroy the devil. Did he fail? No, of course he didn't fail. Satan is a defeated foe and he knows it. There was a, a popular Christian book that came out it's quite a few years ago now um, when I was a fairly young Christian and it had the title of Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth and uh, it, it's a book which has got a lot of helpful things in it but I disagree with the title. Satan is alive but he is not well. He is mortally wounded and he knows it. But of course he is a liar and a deceiver. And the last thing he wants anyone to believe is that he has been defeated by the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan goes to great lengths to convince people that he has invincible power. But that's not true. His power was broken. Because when you read the pages of the New Testament, you understand that God has overcome the forces of evil. Now, I know that if you go into the average Christian bookshop these days, uh, sadly you find sometimes more books on the power of Satan than you find on the power of God. And, and that's a pity. Not that I want to minimize in any way uh, the fact that Satan is powerful, but I want to tell you something that's true that is often ignored in these days, and it is this. Satan is a defeated foe already. And he knows this. But he's a liar, he's a deceiver, he doesn't want you to recognize that. But he is defeated. Listen to these words from 1 John chapter 3. And verse 8, the Apostle wrote, for, the <coughs> for this reason, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And the question we might ask is this, well, did Jesus succeed in what he came to do? Or did he fail? Of course he succeeded. Remember Jesus said, all authority, power, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. How much? All. Which, in my estimation, doesn't leave any real authority or power for Satan. The Bible also tells us that Christians have been taken out of the kingdom of darkness over which Satan rules and they have been transferred into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. So Satan no longer has any rights over us unless we give them to him. And if you want to understand the power of Satan in the life of a believer, um, then think of it this way. It's an illustration I heard some years ago which I, I, I found quite helpful. If you imagine that tethered to that door over there, for instance, there is a ravenous lion tethered on a very long chain. 
And imagine that someone comes into this church through those uh, doors at the back there. And when the lion sees them, they take a it takes a flying leap towards them. But it is caught by the chain round its neck. It can't quite reach the person. And you see, that is a perfect picture of the power of Satan in reference to the believer. Satan can intimidate. He can strike fear by his appearance and his, his demeanor. But he cannot reach because he's tethered. Now, I'm not talking about the non-believer. I'm talking about the Christian. Satan has no power over you. What do I mean by that? I mean zero. The Bible teaches us that he's tethered, he's bound. Um, if you choose to move within the orbit of the lion's chain, then you're in trouble. You'll get consumed. You will be no match for him. And all I'm saying is that Satan has no power over you unless you give it to him. Satan cannot lead you into defeat unless you allow him to do that. Don't imagine for a moment that you are a helpless victim of the evil one. If you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, that is not true. Satan is defeated so far as you are concerned. And what we need to do is to walk in the victory that has already been won. Some people will, um, I know, will say, well, Tony, have you not heard of spiritual warfare? And uh, yes, I have. How can you live these days and not? But um, there we are. There is definitely something to this business of spiritual warfare. But the Apostle Paul tells us that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, against rulers of darkness, against spiritual uh, hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And yes, all of that is true. There are great forces arrayed against us. But then if you turn back to that uh, passage in Colossians, we find out something about those forces. Jesus has disarmed the principalities and powers. And he has made a public example of them, triumphing over them in the cross. And the apostle says that this is what you must do. Simply put on the armor of God. Yes, the Christian life is a battle. And there's some words which are used in the Bible to describe the Christian life. Fight, conquer, strive, battle, overcome, victory. Notice the war terminology there. But the Bible says, walk in the spirit and you'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. It doesn't say that you won't have them. It just says you won't fulfill them. And every battle won is a step on the road to Christian maturity. And that well-known passage about the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6 concludes with these words. And having done all, stand. Stand. It, there's this similar message in, in Galatians chapter 5. Um, 
where it says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Uh, it, it struck me some, that some Christians are rather like a Japanese man um, who came crawling out of the jungles of Indonesia in the mid-1960s um, where he had been hiding for over 20 years because he didn't know that the Second World War was over. And a lot of Christians don't seem to know that the war is over on the cross of Calvary. They just don't know it. So they're living, doing battle with the evil one every day with the mindset that the ultimate bat battle hasn't yet been won. But it has. Satan is already defeated. On his neck are the footprints of the Son of God. But again, he's a liar and a deceiver. And he doesn't want you to know that. And he certainly doesn't want you to act on it. Consider, if you will, the words of Jesus in his great high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, which he prayed just before his crucifixion. And he prayed, Father, I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And just before he died, Jesus was able to declare, Satan has no hold on me. And a few hours later, when he actually hung on the cross, he cried out in a loud voice, it is finished! And that was not a cry of defeat. He wasn't saying, oh, I tried, but it's finished, it's all washed up. No, that isn't what he said. It was a cry of victory. It is completed, it's done, it's fulfilled. And the amazing thing is that wherever the cross of Christ is preached, people are delivered from the kingdom of Satan. And on the night of his crucifixion, Jesus said, Now is the prince of this world cast out. Which means that Satan is a defeated foe this evening. But he doesn't want you to know that. And sadly, a lot of Christians don't. But where the cross is preached, deliverance takes place. The victory takes effect. Um, I, I, I do cringe sometimes when I hear Christians who are sharing or giving testimonies and, and, and they talk about how Satan did this to them and how um, uh, Satan did the other. And, um, I want to sometimes say, for crying out loud, don't we understand when we became Christians that the scripture says, you're taken out of the kingdom of darkness, you're translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And whether you know it or not, across your forehead is emblazoned a message which says, not 666, under new management. And it's because you are under new management that you can use the authority of that management against the kingdom of darkness. The devil has uh, a measure of power, certainly, and we shouldn't underestimate him. But authority wins over power every time. Uh, if you can visualize it, a 40-ton truck 
has power. And if you jumped in front of one, it would flatten you and you would die. But a uniformed policeman who has authority steps into the path of the oncoming juggernaut and puts his hand up and commands it to stop. It comes shuddering to a halt. Because wearing that police uniform, that individual has the authority to stop that vehicle. And that is why the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 13 and verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, put on that uniform as it were, and make no provision for the deeds of the flesh. That is what gives you authority over the kingdom of darkness. And the power is in Jesus alone through the Spirit and through the Word of God. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 14, John writes, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the Word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. The way to overcome the devil is through the Word of God, the Bible, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted, he met every temptation with the Word of God. Every answer he gave to the devil began, it is written, it is written. And wherever someone is filled with the Holy Spirit, and soaked in the Word of God, there the Kingdom of God has been re-established on earth. Because then you're equipped to live a life of obedience to the King. And yes, there will be battles. Every time you get on your knees in prayer, you will be engaged in a spiritual battle. Every time you open your Bible to read God's Word, you'll encounter opposition from the world, the flesh, and the devil. But the victory has already been won on the cross. And when you call on Jesus as your commanding officer, relying on his word and on the power of his spirit, you will overcome whatever your struggles are. Some of you may remember a long time ago, that if you wrote a formal letter to someone, uh, even a letter to a newspaper, you didn't end with the words, yours faithfully or yours sincerely. The old-fashioned way of finishing the letter was to write, I remain, sir, your humble and obedient servant. You never get that these days. But when you live in the kingdom of God, that is the most fitting response to God. To be a subject of the king. And whatever you face this week in terms of trials and tribulations, if you're tossed around with many a conflict, many a doubt, as the hymn writer says, fightings and fears within, without, well, you can have the assurance and the knowledge that in Christ you're on the victory side. Hallelujah. Let's just have a moment to reflect on those truths and ask the Lord that uh, our struggles and our battles may not disappear, but he gives us the power to overcome. May we just for a moment commit this coming week to the Lord. Whatever may lie ahead, whatever things we might be dreading, whatever things uh, 
we, we anticipate to be a, a struggle or difficulty to overcome, we can reflect on the fact that all power, all authority is given to the Lord Jesus and we are subjects in his kingdom and can draw on that victory which was won on the cross.